Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending this meeting. Let me introduce first Ms. Kerry Yuong. Kerry is the senior data scientist at Ranker, where she works on all things related to Ranker.com, Watchworthy, and Ranker Insights. She comes to data science by way of statistics and has five years of experience with the statistical analysis and developing machine and deep learning based solutions for consuming facing application. Also today is joining us Dr. Vincent C. Dr. Vincent is currently the VP of Data Science at Ranker. He has over 20 years of experience as a data scientist and growth hacker in media and consumer analytics. At Ranker, Dr. C leads all data science effort and is dedicated to discovering new business value and insight. Outside of Ranker, Dr. C is a private equity investor and advisor to a, a portfolio of clients covering technology, media, finance, food and beverage, and automotive. He's also volunteers and a mentor advisor at his alma mater, the UCLA. Thank you, Vince and Kerry, for joining us today. Uh, the session is all yours. Please all right. go ahead. Thank you so much, Ruben and uh, Nancy. Uh, thank you, Datacom, for allowing us to take this opportunity to present what we have worked on the uh, last few months. And uh, I, uh, I'm i sure you guys got a lot of other very interesting uh, uh, seminars and talks to go to. I appreciate that you're here to, to listen to ours. So um, what is this topic about? We, we're going to talk about how uh, Ranker turned um, a list, pop culture list, into uh, personalized CV recommendations, right? Um, but before we, I think uh, Ruben has done a great job introducing us. I'll just go through uh, my bio real quick. I've been at Ranker since uh, July 2019. Um, my background is actually mechanical engineering. Somehow uh, find my path into data science. Um, those are my highlights of my career. And uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, Kayu? Hi, I'm Kayu. Um, as Ruben said, I, um, I'm a data scientist at Ranker. I joined earlier this spring. Um, and I have a background in statistics as well as machine learning and deep learning. Um, yeah, happy to be here. So I'll give you an overview of uh, what Ranker is all about. So Ranker is founded and still uh, uh, led by Clark Benson, our CEO, a very passionate guy who turned a uh, uh, gathering list into a sort of business, a publishing uh, business as well, right? Digital publishing. And uh, over the, the last uh, couple of years or so, uh, we have sort of moved on from, not move on, but we want to kind of turn this into a IT business as well because we have amassed uh, so much data, anonymous data mostly on voting patterns. And um, Renta has over 100 employees headquartered proudly in Los Angeles with an amazing view looking at uh, the Hollywood sign. I will have an office in NYC as well. So uh, here are some numbers that are kind of uh, uh, amazing, right? So we've got about 40 million monthly unique views, uh, visitors worldwide. And uh, we just recently, and we, we released a PR story about this as well. 1 billion votes cast over the last 10 years. Okay, think about this, 1 billion votes. And that's over uh, about 10,000 lists that, um, and that people can vote on. We, we cover over almost everything under the sun that you can think of. You can create your own list if you want, right? And uh, I was just doing a search prior to this talk. We've got a list on some of the worst uh, uh, wedding cake uh, failures, right? And people start this like that, people go and vote, uh, anything, right, you can think of. Uh, so we've got three main products we can't build in-house, right? So we've got Ranker Insights, uh, which can't draw uh, psychographic insights and audience insights from the voting data. And the Watchworthy app, which we launched in March, uh, is on iOS and Android now. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a bit. And then we have uh, in-house build data science apps as well. So Watchworthy, you can go to... Uh, to uh, iOS uh, App Store and then Google Play, um, you download it. And what it does is it will ask for your opinions on some kind of uh, uh, survey of what shows, that, uh, it gives you a string of shows and you just let us know whether you like it or you dislike it. If you never really heard of it, never seen it, you just kind of skip it. So we call that the sort of onboarding process, right? And uh, we sort of put a timer on it as well, right? But don't, don't feel too pressured to, to kind of race through that, right? Um, after we capture your profile, uh, your taste profile, we'll recommend you a list of shows that are watchworthy in that sense. There'll be scores and whatnot. 
And you can go on further in the app to add it to your watch list, uh, potentially share with friends and things like that. So one thing I want to kind of point this out, right, which is the second bullet point here. We're using pure first party voting data, right? So uh, Clark Benson is very adamant about this when I first joined, right? Say, hey Vince, we've got all this taste profile. We, I want to do sort of opinion mining based on that. Uh, no, no metadata, right? I, I want to avoid metadata. I want people to say, if you like crime, we show you a bunch of crime shows and things like that. Uh, purely based on that. So that's very important, which I'm going to show you why we have some of those challenges as well that, uh, that we saw for tackling. So we've got Watchworthy, and we've got a data science app, uh, which I call Rack Algo, right? Um, so when I joined last summer, I was brought on to, this was one of my goals, right? Uh, uh, challenges, really. Say that, hey, Vince, we need to build a Rack engine. And uh, I, uh, I work with product engineering to find a way to say, hey, if I have a bunch of different algorithms, how do we go about vetting the algorithm, at least internally? Remember, we've got about 100 employees. I'll have them uh, give some opinion and capture feedback. So when I hear and build out an app, right, it's not the most uh, uh, um, beautiful thing out there, but at least it works as intended, right? So we've got people coming in, you log in, you'll see a page like that. And on this box here, you, it's a drop down on a predictive search drop down. You can enter the TV shows that you like, right? And on this box here, the kind of TV shows you, you, you don't really decide and whatnot. And then you kind of go ahead and recommend uh, the results. Uh, in this particular version, we have got four different tabs. At the height of this, I built out maybe 10 to, 10 to 15 different tabs, right? And people are going, keeping the taste profile the same and go through every tab to see the difference in the results. And uh, the results is not just thumbnails and want to give you some scores and there are some markers to indicate uh, the kind of show that we track with certain uh, specialized tags. What's really interesting here I want to mention is you see this four boxes at each corner of the uh, thumbnail when, when you hover them. This allows the user to go in and say whether I like this show, which is a class green sign, or I don't like uh, this show, I don't agree this show should come back in the recommendation or I'm not sure by heard of, and then not sure, never heard of. So in this particular profile, which, uh, which was one of my profiles, and I go in and say, hey, uh, of all the results that come back, so this page actually goes down quite a bit. I've got 52% that agree, about 13% disagree, and so on and so forth. Everything here is tracked on a per user basis. So when we open this up to people uh, wide, company wide, everyone who log in, they can, uh, Enter their taste profile, I track all of those bits. And then when I say, okay, the testing is done, let me aggregate some analytics and present results, right? So here's one of the challenges we've got. So we've got about 10,000 lists mentioned in the previous slide. Not every list is going to be qualified to be uh, uh, trained in the data, right, for the recommendation engine. And here's why. This is just by doing a search, say, TV shows. So, so uh, just go back real quick. Rec, rec, the watchworthy recommendation is only for TV shows for now, right? So movie stuff is kind of still in the works. If you enter TV shows, you realize that, great, I've got all this great TV list on the left side, which is the best of this, the funniest of that, uh, the one with the most action or whatnot. And then we've got the worst list, right? Naturally, we've got best, got kind of worst. Do we really want the worst list to be in there, right? Uh, so we did a few testing with the help of product engineering as well. And we decided that we're, this is still somewhat highly curated, right? We have the best of the funniest, the smartest, you know, all of those lists are now being used to train the, uh, the recommendation engine. And then we have, we've got a second challenge, right? Which is voters and buyers voting. So how do people really vote, right? So Clark has uh, different ways of looking at this. Some people might vote the ones they know about and say, I think this should come move higher. And if you look at this particular profile here, it feels normal, right? Like someone coming, go down a list of favorite ice creams, which is, this is an actual list, right? Hagen Dazs is number one. And if I like Ben and Jerry, I should upvote on that, right? But if I don't like Hagen Dazs, so I don't have opinion, do I really downvote on that? 
So we have a very lively discussion about how people behave, and you kind of passion in psychology and things like that. Now, this particular profile is what we see from time to time, right? Maybe someone come in, perhaps an employee of Agandas. I'm going to upvote on Agandas, and everything else is crap. And they repeat this, and they go tell their friends on Reddit, on Twitter, everywhere else to do the same. And people will spend time to write uh, scripts, all right, bot scripts, to go in and do exactly the same thing. And because of this, we started building uh, uh, classes of how users vote and say, OK, there's this group of classes uh, of users could be haters. They are like the outliers. Let's not include them in the training set, right? So we've got list bias. Uh, we got a different style list. And now we have on the user level uh, in terms of what the challenge, right? Now, this is the next thing we kind of talk about because of using pure data. Uh, remember Clark uh, Benson, the CEO, said that I don't want to really use that much of the metadata. I try to minimize on that. Now, if you look at, uh, I can't start on the, on the right side here. Uh, we've got Matthew McConaughey, uh, our marketing team, I put that in there. And uh, these are the four movies he has acted in. This is actor-based uh, recommendation, and you start thinking, on the road, there's going to be a director, producer, studio, and so on and so forth. And then there's also the genre-based recommendation, rom-com, in this case, here, uh, for example, here, right? Now, if we don't deal with the metadata recommendation, this is what we see potentially for voters, right? So a voter can come in and vote on comedy, drama, adventure. We're not stopping that person for liking uh, animation, right? So. As you can see on the left side, it crosses all kinds of metadata, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, content, right? And you multiply that by a, a, a number of the four, 40 million unique profiles that we can train on. This became a very rich set of data. So this one, so because of that, though, right? Uh, we don't, we are not using metadata. Here's a fourth challenge we kind of face. Now, if I like a particular older TV show, what new TV show should I watch? Okay, so kind of following me on this, right? Breaking Bad 2008. Um, I hope most of you guys have seen it or at least engaged with it at some point. Now, if I like Breaking Bad, this, are, this is item to item uh, recommendation, right? This are a list of shows that came back for Breaking Bad. This was based on one of the older algorithms that we used. Uh, naturally, we have Breaking Bad here as being 100%, so on and so forth. None of these shows here are considered new show by our definition. Right? New show in the last uh, couple of years, 18, 19, and 20, right? Now, if you look at Chernobyl, which is another great um, docu-series drama uh, uh, from HBO, Chernobyl tend to return newer shows, and they are indicated by the, by the shows in the blue box. Right. I can't deem the, the older shows uh, down a little bit, right? And here's what we are facing. Now, if you are someone who pays for a bunch of new shows, you tend to have a lot more new shows that return because of the way uh, the data is being set up where people are coming and vote, right? Now, if you are someone who haven't really followed TV for a while, you've got shows that remember from a few years, how do we solve that problem for you, okay? Now, in some related work, uh, very tangential, right, um, that we can't kind of find out that it could be kind of interesting uh, if this has been uh, solved before in some papers, I can think of somewhere. I'm going to go through this uh, fairly quickly as well. So we've got fairness awareness hybrid recommendation system, right? Because we started looking at, hey, if new shows tend not to return old show, are we being unfair to new show or in, in some sense like that, right? So we started investigating if that might work. Now, the second and third papers was something that uh, we look into the idea of uh, uh, different personalities, right? Now, these two papers is all about aggregating personalities. That I'm going to talk a little bit about it as a group watch and stuff like that. But they have very interesting uh, ways of tackling um, a sort of uh, people with different opinions and being in the same class. So how do you aggregate them up to a uh, opinion leader. But I was, we were looking at it as how do we reverse that, right, because of the old and new show taste profile. 
last but not least, this is something that you kind of found out just a couple about a month or two ago. And uh, these two engineers at Google came out with an idea using Splitter, right? Um, use uh, in graph theory. And these are all decent papers to start off. I will hand here, uh, so we, for next, we will talk about the approach that Kayu will take over from here. Kayu? Makes sense. Yeah, so um, the next couple slides, just to reiterate, we're talking specifically about how we're dealing with this problem of um, recommending uh, new shows, right? So, so just to recap, and I think Vince um, mentioned this just now, the problem is specifically, how do we recommend new shows when the majority of the data that's being used to train the model is um, dominated by older shows. And also a user's taste profile, which is say the set of shows that a user expresses a preference on that's used as input to scoring is dominated by older shows, right? Um, and specifically, you know, the problem isn't how do we recommend old shows from old inputs or new shows from new inputs, but new shows from old inputs. Um, and so having spent some time thinking about this, we sort of reframe this as a class imbalance problem, right? So class imbalance is something that's arguably, you know, always present um, in, in the context of classification. It's essentially how do we detect or identify data points corresponding to um, one class or label um, that has relatively fewer data points corresponding to it um, when compared to like the other label or class. Um, and you know, this is a very well-documented and um, common problem in the context of classification. And there are a number of techniques that, you know, are very popular and seem to have some promise, such as um, upsampling from the minority class um, or smote synthetic minority oversampling technique or opposite to that would be downsampling from the majority class or in the context of deep learning data augmentation, which is very similar to upsampling, but instead of making you know, exact replicas of each, um, uh, each instance, you, you essentially replicate it but make a little bit of a change so that's not it's sort of adds a bit of diversity into your training data. Um, and, you know, so we, we ran a bunch of experiments sort of in this ballpark of things common to these classification techniques. Um, before I talk about that, I just wanna um, get a little clear on what exactly do we mean when we say class imbalance in the context of this recommendation problem. Um, next slide, please, Vince. Okay, so, you know, the problem, as we said before, is how do we recommend old shows, or, or sorry, new shows from old shows? So one way to think about this is we could cast the release year of every show as a class, right? And so if we plot, say, the distribution of votes by release year, this is the distribution we see. And yes, it's relatively imbalanced. You know, there's definitely relatively more class, uh, more votes, you know, in the 2010s than, you know, prior. But it's sort of hard to see how if you train a model on, on this data set that, you know, votes prior to 2019 would be, would be that poorly represented, right? However, as I said before, the problem that we're dealing with in recommendation is not how do we detect the classes themselves, the classes themselves aren't the issue, but it's it's the, the link between the old and the new votes. Okay. Um, next slide, please, Vince. So, so here's where I'm going to introduce a new term, which is um, bridge voter. And we define bridge voter as a voter who's voted on at least one new show, 2019 or 2020, as well as at least one other show, whether it's also a new show or an older show. And this is sort of our key concept because recommending new shows from old shows is dependent on these bridge voters votes, right? Um, and so here, here's the distribution of the votes by these bridge voters, right? And so you can see that of people who voted on a new node, on a new show, majority of them vote on new shows, right? That's the spike over 2018 and 2019. And very few of them, you know, vote on shows older than let's say 2015-ish, right? And so it's, it's easier to see, I think, in this distribution how 
if we trained a model on this distribution of data, you can imagine how if you gave an input that fell, you know, somewhere further left on the scale, um, you probably wouldn't get very good recommendations, right, for new shows. Um, so next, I'm going to talk about the different experiments that we tried to deal with this problem. Uh, next slide, please, Vince. So, so to referring back to those classification based techniques, um, here are some things we tried, right? So we tried upsampling the votes from the bridge voters and we varied you know, the percentages. So we tried boosting it by 100%, 200%, 300%, et cetera. We tried combining that with downsampling votes from non-bridge voters to kind of even the distribution. We also tried applying different thresholds um, to determine who, what kinds of bridge voters we would upsample, uh, upsample from, right? So vote count, we thought maybe upsampling from like our super fans who, who voted on, you know, cast at least, you know, 100 votes across their lifetime on Ranker or vote type, we only upsample from people who like, like shows as opposed to people who dislike shows or vote spread, which is say, um, upsampling from people who voted on, let's say at least five distinct years um, or at least you know one show from each distinct decade. Um, however, after we ran through all these trials, we realized that the challenge that still existed and that none of these none of these trials had really handled was the fact that because we were preserving the voting history for each user that we upsampled from, um, we weren't fundamentally changing the distribution of the bridge voters' votes, right? We were changing the magnitude of, of, of their votes, of the distribution, but we weren't changing the shape of it. And so the imbalance still remained. Um, and so next slide, it's just gonna illustrate this. Uh, next slide, please, Vince. So, so quick illustration, you know, on the left is our original voting set. So let's say I'm a bridge voter. I voted on, um, three nodes, 2019, 2010, 2005. So 2019 is my new show. I replicate myself once. And so I get the data set on the right. And you can see that the distribution of votes per year doesn't change in shape, only magnitude, right? And so then we thought, well, basically, you know, as long as we keep my voting history intact, this will never change, right? So what, what if what if we instead try to break my voting patterns a little bit and upsample each constituent pair of bridge votes? Next slide, please. Vince. And so here we're upsampling, as I said, each constituent pair of bridge votes. So uh, 2010, 2019 gets bumped up once, 2005, 2010 get bumped up once, and that's appended to the original data set. And what we see here is that it does change the shape of the distribution. And if you look at it across you know, multiple years and multiple users, the distribution across years does change. However, what it leads to is a spike over our new show bucket, right? Because you're constantly basically replicating the 2019 or 2020 show. And so what happens is that if you train a model on this resulting data set, all of your recommendations tend to cluster around 2019 to 2020 because you know, a model will learn from where the majority of the data set sits, right? Um, so this then led us to think, well, the problem here is fundamentally that we're trying to concatenate all of the constituent upsampled bridge votes, right? So what if we didn't concatenate everything? What if we kept them separate um, or tried to separate them somehow? Um, and that's what really led to what we now call split sampling. Um, next slide, please, Vince. So, so, so as, um, as I said, we thought, what about building individual models for each constituent set of bridge votes, right? And so theoretically, one way you could do it is you could just train a model for every single pairwise combination of old to new shows, or old to new years, old to new shows. Um, but, you know, that, obviously leads to a lot of complexity because you'll have a pair for every year that you have. Um, but so, so, you know, the challenge is essentially how can you balance, you know, complexity with performance, right? And so what we actually ended up finding was somewhere between five to, a five to 10 year bucket um, did a really good job of um, balancing performance in terms of strengthening the old to new 
um, uh, vote relationships, as well as balancing complexity in terms of the number of models and the amount of training, the amount of training that has to be done um, uh, in both the like, sorry, the amount of complexity involved in the model training and scoring pipelines. So, so here's just an illustration of how we do this. We have an original data set. We train one model M0 on this original data set. We train another model M1 on say the 2019 to 2020 set. And then we train a third model M2 on the 2005 and 2019 um, set. But as I said, we, we chose to bucket it eventually. Um, and so next slide, please, Vince. And so this is the overall methodology, right? You bin your shows into release year decades. So in, our, in this case, we chose 10 years, but you could do five years or you know, any, any set of years that you think is appropriate. You then split your bridge votes, bridge voters votes into these buckets. Um, you build an overall model on the raw data set plus individual models for each, each binned set, each in this case, decade specific models. Um, and then finally, you you score, you know, your taste profile, and you ensemble um, you ensemble the results, right, to basically maximize um, the scores on the new shows um, um, for each user's rec stream. Um, next slide, please, Vince. And so this is just a you know a more complicated diagram of um, that example before. Um, and this is more from the scoring side. So we have an input list on the left. Um, someone's expressing a preference on, you know, shows across 19 from 1990 to 2019. We would then have to split that taste profile um, into the years corresponding to each model. They go through their um, respective models and they each um, output a recommendation stream. And then we would then take um, the new show recommendations from the split models and, and ensemble them back into um, the rec stream from the overall model. And that's essentially it. Um, and now um, I'll just pass it back to Vince and he'll um, show you uh, an example for a single user's taste profile. Cool. Thank you, Craig. So um, I, you know, we've been trying to see how do we illustrate this for, for the audience, right? Uh, I could kind of show you maybe uh, the recommendation for shows that come back, whatnot. Uh, but we've decided to perhaps zoom out, right? Imagine you're looking at this from space, right? And here you you understand uh, in, a, in a minute how that works. So I've got two boxes in here, right? Here is the actual user's taste profile. Someone came in actually like the shows in the blue box, and then kind of dislike the shows in, in the red box. Here we are seeing two different results, right? So one of them is before split sampling, the other one is after split sampling. I think you can kind of guess which one might be which, right? Uh, I wish I can see your hands going up and down, maybe guessing what, but I'm just going to review the results there, right? So we've got the original one on the left, and then we've got the one the split sampling on the right. Um, bear with me for a bit how this kind of uh, how do we track the shows that have been sort of promoted because of uh, split sampling model? If you see a blue box uh, show here, right, that means it's been promoted by split sampling. Okay, the one the, right here. See all this little blue box here. Now, I kind of highlighted the blue ones on the original one, uh, original algorithm. So you can kind of eyeball the thumbnail if you perhaps, like, you can see Watchmen here was here before and Watchmen end up being there, right? Because of uh, the split sampling. Now, what does the red box uh, thumbnail mean? Um, if after going through split sampling and then we did, uh, like could you say, get the maximum number of shows. So one of the strategies, what we call, well, we didn't coin that term. Someone else did in, uh, in computer science uh, by Judith uh, Master from Netherlands, I think. She had this, strategy, she called the most pleasure strategy, right? Basically, the model will look at uh, recommended score for a particular show. Now, if that score is already high enough, split sampling is just going to leave, leave, uh, let it be. And those are the shows in the red box. So if they're high enough, we're going to let it be. But if they're not high enough, we take the maximum score that the split sampling returns. 
and then we move them up, which are the ones in the red box. Um, we've done this to, so this uh, was developed after the, 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 algorithm, um, the app was launched, right, for Android and iOS. So we went back and we sample like in, in, in chunks of 500 users, we test between the origin and the, the new model algorithm. It's statistically significant that they are getting more new shows. And because they have rated some of these new shows in the past, we can also track it to see if they actually do like uh, some of these new shows that we promoted due to our state sampling. And um, the algorithm is, uh, is running, it's being deployed, and we were hoping to get some real world data before this talk, but uh, follow, follow us on our blog or white paper at some point, and uh, I'm sure uh, there'll be very interesting results as well. So what's next for this, all right? Um, instead of looking at old and new shows, how about movies and TV, right? Uh, if you like this old TV show, what new movie should you watch? If you like this old TV show, um, old movie, what new TV show you should watch? So that's, that I feel like that's a lot of opportunities for, for cross category and very niche genres as well, right? A uh, uh, particular new genre, dark comedy, there has to be some new genres out there that people might find very interesting or they come up with because it's a very creative artistic space. And how do we kind of bridge them all together again, right? So the second thing uh, we anticipate where this could be used is for group watching recommendations. And then remember that two papers I talk about virtual opinion users and things like that. Uh, I'll give you a, a sort of a high level of how, how this might work. You've got a household of uh, grandparents, parents, and kids, right? Generation, right? They have about three generations. They all have different taste profiles, but they come into a room together, right? I suppose we need to recommend them something. Is there somewhere split sampling models can use to, uh, to optimize that, right? Because uh, the older folks, the grandparents might know that the godfather in the 1970s and all that. The parents might know some of the newer shows, but the kids count follow more of the influencer stuff on YouTube or whatever it is, right? So we, we see maybe that maybe opportunity in that, right? And uh, we'd like to hear, maybe put in the, the chat or somewhere, connect with us to see how this might help your business case or whatever you might be passionate about solving. Um, we'd like to hear that as well. So that brings us to the conclusion of this talk. Uh, thank you, Data.com, for setting this up. Thank you, every uh, all the sponsors here. Uh, I think this is uh, this has been a great opportunity to be able to show what we are doing at Ranker. Um, for you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think we'll um, answer some questions now. We have about uh, five minutes, maybe a little less, for questions. Um, you can ask by using your Whova app, and I will read them to the uh, to the presenters. We have one question here on the Whova app. What do the colors highlighting on the scoring pipeline slide indicate? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, it kind Vince, of broke you, up there. Could you go to slide 19, please? Uh, This one. Um, so I assume you're referring to the highlights here. So um, this is just showing what we mean when we say we take the max score per new show. So you can see that, you know, there's shows C, D, X, S, all corresponding to new shows um, coming from the overall model. And then from the 1990s model, there's X, show X. And then from show of the 2000s models, there's shows C and S. So basically, we, we you know we stick everything together in in the first um, stream coming out of that, and then and then we take the max score per show, and that's how the ensemble works, right? So basically, um, an example would be show C, which gets a score of eighty five from the two thousands model, and it gets a score of seventy nine from the overall model. So by taking the max of that, we we boost um, we basically boost the score for that show. Um, using split sampling. Hope that answers your question.
Anything else in your Whova app, Ruben? Mind mine didn't show that question. Uh, I think they I also think have I'm one more question in the slide nineteen. Are you ever sampling the latest show rankings? Um, can you? Sorry, can, can you? Someone, can you clarify what you mean by oversampling? Let me see if I then could clarify this. Say the uh, oversampling within each of the models. Um, oh, no. So I think what you mean is that for each split, um, so for instance, if we, if we look back at slide 17, Vince, um, the training data that goes into M1 and M2 is just, it's just one replica. It's just one, it's a replica of that split itself, right? Um, no upsampling. We did, we did actually try, mm -hmm. um, applying upsampling within each split. And interestingly, we, we saw that it worked just as well, if not better without any oversamp, without any upsampling, um, and, and just with the split approach. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, Carrie, thank you very much. Okay. okay, everyone, I think we are time for just one more question. Let's see. <laughs> Seems like a, a comment from Aaron right then. Aaron, what's up? Um, Recommendation on cuts would be great, yeah, why not? Because okay. uh, they might have very uh, a split the personality and taste profile. We, we certainly don't want you guys to uh, split up because of us, right? So uh, we'll find something and uh, uh, Ranker Watchworthy uh, product team is working hard to get uh, something in place for that. Uh, it's gonna be nice, yeah. Okay, uh, we're at the time, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Beans, and care you for sharing your knowledge today. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you, and everyone to attendees. Thank you for joining us for this. Thank session. you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have, have an awesome day. Goodbye. Goodbye.